Greetings, Art History One students from one of the great seven wonders of the world. This is the Parthenon atop the Acropolis in Athens in ancient Greece. I hope that you are doing fantastically well. Today we'll be discussing one of the second greatest civilizations of all time, potentially either before or right after Mesopotamia. Um, historically, clearly before, um, after Mesopotamia, but its importance will be up to you to determine. And that actually is even a midterm um, question that may be coming up in the very near future, is that what is the most significant culture that we have studied in the early history and development of humankind? And after today and over the next couple of days, um, you'll be evaluating whether that's Mesopotamia or Greece. So let's get on our way. So today what we're going to do is let me share my screen with you again. So you can actually see the overview here. There we go. Greek art is one of the, the, the time periods that we know the most about because it is basically what we call the foundation of the Western world. It's the foundation of the world that we live in. We basically trace our ancestry, our heritage back to the Greco-Roman world. The Romans are gonna take over the Greeks in about a thousand years, but the Greeks are gonna start us on that path towards modern day civilization. And so if you look at Greek art, note it's one of the weird time periods where we actually have two different starting dates. It's either 1100 or 776, and it goes to 146 BCE. Again, we are still in before the Common Era. It's our next period, the Romans, that will bring us up into the Common Era. There we go. So one of the things that's nice about ancient Greece is based upon movies and videos and mythology, the astronomical calendar, we do know a fair amount of ancient Greece uh, or about ancient Greeks and about ancient Greece already from their mythology. Notably, one is going to be Hercules, which ironically is the Romanized name of that. It really should be Heracles, no real reason to make that. But many of the concepts in Disney's Hercules are actually pretty good and accurate. And so when we think about what we already know about ancient Greece, we already probably know, most of you already know who Zeus is. You probably know the love goddess of Aphrodite. You probably have an idea of Athena, the goddess of wisdom and war. You've seen Percy Jackson, many of you or read the books. So we have a fair, fairly good grasp on at least what popular culture represents in ancient Greece. Now, when we look at ancient Greece, kind of the truth behind it, one of the things we have to consider is their landscapes. This area is an area that is about to become a world superpower. And they're gonna to have to become a world superpower. They first do it through trade and military because there's not a lot of very good high quality agricultural land that can grow huge amounts of produce and products that they can actually eat. So they very much have the Mediterranean diet starts in ancient Greece. They're very healthy olive oil, which they can grow quite well in trade. They're gonna have a very a luxurious wine um, culture that's going to develop. And they're going to eat a lot of fish and things from the sea. The other thing we'll consider as we think about ancient Greece is the fact that it's not a unified group. It's really hard even to say ancient Greece, even though that's what I'm going to do. We're really going to have to divide it. And two major areas that we often talk about are Sparta and the, Ath the Athenians or and Athens, where Sparta is the bellicose war wartime culture. They even have two kings in case one of them actually gets killed or one is out actually in battle in war. It's going to focus on military training. All men become soldiers. They even killed weak babies so they have the best crop of both men and women to reproduce and make their society strong. The Athenians, they, their basis is on education. It's on philosophy. It's on art. But what they do share and why we call them both Greek, well, they're both in Greece. They both have city-states. They both share the same gods in terms of religion. They share the same myths, the same language. They do actually both have a large preponderance on slave culture, particularly slaves that are taking in war, and both rely on the idea of city councils and some aspect of democracy or voting for different individuals and their rights, at least amongst the male population. So I wanna show you a video, and for many of you, you've seen pieces of this video. This is from the movie 300. It talks about how the Spartans, to talk about how different they are, how the Spartans actually. And so now let's compare that with the day in the life of an ancient Athenian, that we see the bellicose war culture, just to show you how different these Greek societies are when we talk about ancient Greece. <laughs> It's 
427 BCE, and the worst internal conflict ever to occur in the ancient Greek world is in its fourth year. The Peloponnesian War is being fought between the city-states of Athens and Sparta, as well as their allies. The Athenians can't match the formidable Spartan army on land, so they've abandoned the countryside and moved inside the walls surrounding their city and port, now provisioned by a superior fleet and extensive maritime empire. The cramped conditions have taken a toll, and a recent plague wiped out a third of the population, but city life goes on. Archias and Dexileia live in the center of Athens. As a painter of high-class pottery, Archias is relatively well-off and takes great interest in the city's affairs. Dexileia, on the other hand, can't participate in politics or own property. The couple are grateful to the gods that three of their four children, a son and two daughters, have survived past infancy. Many parents see daughters as a liability since they require dowries to find husbands but Archias is confident that his wealth will allow him to make good matches for them without going bankrupt. Like many Athenians, the family owns slaves. Originally from Thrasy, they were captured in war. Thrata does most of the housework and helps raise the children. Philon is a pedagogos who supervises the son's education, teaching him reading and writing. Archias is up early because there's a meeting of the ecclesia, the assembly of citizens, taking place at dawn. Before setting out, he burns incense and pours a libation at the small shrine in the courtyard on behalf of his entire household. Dexileia will remain at home all day, teaching her daughters domestic skills. Later, she'll retire to the inner courtyard for some fresh air. When Archias arrives at the Agora, the civic and commercial heart of the city, he finds the square swarming with his fellow citizens native-born adult males who have completed military training. Attached to the central monument is a notice board with the meeting's agenda. Today, there's only one item of discussion, what to do with the people of Mytilene, a city on the island of Lesbos where a revolt against Athenian rule has just been put down. The meeting takes place on a hill west of the Acropolis, known as the Penix. The word means tightly packed, and the crowd of 5,000 citizens makes it clear why. The heralds purify the hill by sprinkling its boundary with pig's blood and call for order. As everyone sits on benches facing the platform, the presiding officer opens the meeting with the words, Tis agoreven bulete, who wishes to address the assembly? One by one, citizens speak, some advising mercy, others bent on vengeance. A motion is proposed to execute all the Mytilenaeans and enslave their women and children because they betrayed their Athenian allies during a time of war. A majority raises their right hands in favor. Once the meeting's over, Archias heads back to the Agora to buy food and wine. Hundreds have gathered there to discuss the results, many unhappy with the decision. When Archias returns home, he tells Dexileia about the debate. She thinks that killing the innocent as well as the guilty is harsh and counterproductive, and tells him as much. Around dusk, Archias goes to a friend's house for a symposium. The nine men drink wine and discuss the meeting well into the night. Archias shares his wife's opinion, urging mercy, and his friends eventually agree. Before dawn, something unprecedented happens. Heralds circulate throughout Athens, announcing the council has called another meeting. The second debate is equally heated, but a new resolution to execute only the leaders of the revolt narrowly passes. Yet there's a problem. A ship with orders to carry out the first resolution was dispatched the previous day. And so another ship quickly sets sail to countermand the order, a race of democracy against time. Did you enjoy this glimpse of daily life in an ancient civilization? So you can see the differences. Even though they are both in wartime cultures, there's a radical departure between the training and what people do on a daily it's basis, 427. unless we're actually in wartime. So before we begin what, in what we call the heart of Greek civilization, I do want to point out three areas. There are three different groups of individuals that are kind of the pre-Greeks that live in the area. If you ever take a classics course in the future, 
in art history, they will actually go through more in depth these three cultures. But they are the Mycenaeans, they are the Minoans, and they're the Cyclades. We'll see at least two of these cultures for what they kind of represent for Greek culture as it develops to its height, its apotheosis with the classical Greek era in fourth and fifth century Greece. But these are the early stages of Greek development. So when Greek develops that phalanx and develop a military strategy that allow them to start populating, winning wars, and start to rule the world, or as city-states start to win and kind of rule different parts of the world, it's really on the backbone of these three civilizations, which are the pre-Greek civilizations. And here you can actually see it's where the Minoans are, where the Minotaur um, legend comes from, right here on the island of Crete. Now, ancient Greece, with those two different um, starting points, which we'll talk about in a moment, either 1100 or 776, goes to 146 BCE. And the question for us is, why do we care about ancient Greece? What is it about ancient Greece that makes it worthy of study? And for us, that why do we care starts off with democracy. Now, even though the ancient Greeks have a very limited democracy, and, and very limited, it really is for citizens, and those citizens often have to over own property and go through military training. The vast majority of Greece does not have this. Half of them are women, they have about, have have about 30% of a slave population. So at any given point, democracy in Greece is at best 20%, maybe 25% of the overall population, but they all do get to vote and democracy hails. No one outranks anyone else once you get to that 20, 25%. They're going to be the inventors of theater, they are going to create our modern day gender roles, which we are still working with today. They're going to create the Greek phalanx or the first organized military. They're going to leave us with classical architecture, which is still the foundation of Washington DC and other places around the world. They're going to give us the concept of expressionism. And they're also going to start to make weapons out of iron, which is a game changer in terms of military history. As such, I want to show you actually how a phalanx works. Now phalanx from our video, Mankind, the Story of Us, this is literally what allows the Greeks to take over both the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians at about 400 BCE, two world superpowers at almost the same time, because they are working as a group rather than fighting individually. So here's how the phalanx. And that is the military technology, that idea of all working together to block them, almost like a giant turtle or armored tank. And then actually the first group pushes them off. They actually stab, the next group actually then stabs down to kill anyone so they can't stab up as they move. So they work very much in unison. The most powerful military force the world had ever seen up until that time period. So the Romans actually make it a professional army. The other thing that's going to show up, particularly out of the Athenians, is this idea of Greek philosophy. Greeks are gonna be the ones who invent this kind of concept. And philosophy um, literally means the love of wisdom. The three great leaders of this movement are Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, arguably some of the brightest men in human history. So bright that particularly Plato and Aristotle, there's a quote that says, all of Western history and all of Western philosophy, all of Western thought can be credited or attributed to Plato and Aristotle, a teacher, Plato, and his student, Aristotle, who's constantly questioning Plato's understanding of the world. So our idea of fate versus free will, whether knowledge comes from gods or nature, the idea of ideal forms such as beauty, truth, justice versus goodness, and the idea of empiricism, looking at a scientific realm around the world, really comes out of Plato and Aristotle. So here's Plato's best and sometimes worst ideas. Sometimes credit as being one of the two or three brightest men in all of history, Plato, Aristotle, Leonardo da Vinci. Few individuals have influenced the world and many of today's thinkers like Plato. One 20th century philosopher even went so far as to describe all of Western philosophy as a series of footnotes to Plato. He created the first Western university and was teacher to ancient Greece's greatest minds, including Aristotle. But even one of the founders of philosophy wasn't perfect. Along with his great ideas, Plato had a few that haven't exactly stood the test of time. So here are brief rundowns of a few of his best and worst ideas. Plato argued that beyond our imperfect world was a perfect, unchanging world of forms. Forms are the ideal versions of the things and concepts we see around us. Eventually the Christians are going to borrow this and it's going to be the concept of the Christian God, all-knowing, all-good, all-powerful. Very different than Zeus. YouTube channel 
and even the ideal justice or ideal love, our own reality is comprised of imperfect copies of ideal forms. Plato argued that philosophers should strive to contemplate and understand these perfect forms so that they may better navigate our misleading reality. While it may seem silly, the disconnect between the world as it appears and the greater truth behind it is one of philosophy's most vexing problems. It's been the subject of thousands of pages by theologians, philosophers, and screenwriters alike. It raises questions like, should we trust our senses to come to the truth or our own reason? For Plato, the answer is reason. It alone provides us with at least the potential to contemplate the forms. But reason didn't always pan out for Plato himself. When he sought to situate humankind amongst the animals, he lumped us in with birds. Featherless bipeds was his official designation. Diogenes the Cynic, annoyed by this definition, stormed into Plato's class with a plucked chicken, announcing, Behold, Plato's man. But back to a few good ideas. Plato is one of the earliest political theorists on record, and with Aristotle, is seen as one of the founders of political science. He reasoned that being a ruler was no different than any other craft, whether a potter or doctor, and that only those who had mastered the craft were fit to lead. Ruling was the craft of contemplating the forms. In his Republic, Plato imagined a utopia, where justice is the ultimate goal. Plato's ideal city seeks a harmonious balance between its individual parts and should be led by a philosopher king. Millennia before his time, Plato also reasoned that women were equally able to rule in this model city. Unfortunately, Plato was inconsistent with women, elsewhere likening them to children. He also believed that a woman's womb was a live animal that could wander around in her body and cause illness. This bad idea, also espoused by other contemporaries of Plato, was sadly influential for hundreds of years in European medicine. Furthermore, he thought that society should be divided into three groups, producers, the military, and the rulers, and that a great noble lie should convince everyone to follow this structure. The noble lie he proposed was that we're all born with gold, silver, or a mixture of brass and iron in our souls, which determine our roles in life. Some thinkers have gone on to credit the idea of the noble lie as a prototype for 20th century propaganda and the philosopher king as inspiration for the dictators that used them. Should a few bad ideas tarnish Plato's status as one of the greatest philosophers in history? No. Plato gave the leaders and thinkers who came after him a place to start. Through the centuries, we've had the chance to test those ideas through writing and experience and have accepted some while rejecting others. We are continuing to refine, amend, and edit his ideas, which have become foundations of the modern world. And so one of the things that shows up with Plato, as we think kind of through Greek culture, this idea, this love of wisdom and knowledge, is the idea of the myth of the cave. Whereas if you were locked up, as you can see, actually in the cave itself, and only saw the shadows of the things that were real, you would assume that the shadows themselves were the real things. And so upon leaving and getting more detail, you would not expect that the, the things for the real would actually be real, but it was just the shadow you would be looking for. And it would take some time for you to figure that out. And we don't know because this is actually an untestable theory, but it's called the myth of the cage. He also comes up with the idea that fate is the most important, which we will see when we actually start talking about theater fate versus free will. He believes that the best knowledge is knowledge that comes from the gods, the most truthful knowledge. And this idea of ideal forms, beauty, truth, justice, and that all equals the goodness, that is the, the early formation of what God is within the Christian world, radically different than Zeus, who is generally a pretty bad dude associated with rapes and tortures of numerous people. The Plato versus Aristotelian or Aristotle's argument literally leads the idea in the matrix. Do you want the red pill, which basically says that I'm going to give you the truth of the hidden stuff behind the forms, or do you want the blue pill, which is about the reality of what you see on a daily basis, and that's what you experience as truth? And so even the matrix today is based upon an argument 
that Plato and Aristotle made about what is the truth of where we get knowledge. So the question for you, would you take the world of experience that you see, the Aristotelian world, or would you take the blue pill to actually understand what's behind kind of the science, the innovation of what's behind it, even if it's a much more negative viewpoint of the world? Or do you want the world pulled over your eyes and you just want to experience the positive of the world? This is the question that, that Morpheus is asking Neo. Greek gods and goddesses, of course, they are with us today. They're often renamed, in fact, the planetary gods at night are named after these. The Romans are going to take over the Greek gods and name those. Our medical staff is actually the staff right here of Hermes. Our Nike logo is from the winged victory god. The FTD logo that actually delivers our flowers, also from Hermes. And our male symbol is actually from an arrow um, going through a target, which is a symbol of the god um, Ares. And so here you can see brothers and sisters of Zeus. That's the blue line. And now Zeus and Hera are married, so there's a little bit of incest going on with the gods, as well as the children of Zeus then, including Athena, which gets pulled out of Zeus's head, so a female in charge of wisdom and war. The zodiac is also going to be an ancient Greek intervention, and many of us still follow those astrological signs today. The other thing is that the Mesopotamians and the Greeks, the Greeks believe that they are better. They are the newer, more powerful. They beat Mesopotamian in a, in a world and basically the world war of the time, um, the kind of the Persian uh, invading that takes place. And so they claim that the Mesopotamian groups, that they very much are barbarians. They're outside, they're uncivilized. And so because the Mesopotamians fermented their wheat and their barley into beer to drink, they start associating beer with uncultured barbarians, people who like sport, people who are very rural, whereas wine people are people that are cultured, theater, academics and the art. We still see that today. Wine drinking in New York City, beer drinking in Iowa. So we actually have that as something that, that split within division between urban and rural very much actually shapes our world today that the Greeks started. Now, Greek art, why two different start dates? It's because depending upon which Greek you talk to, they date their founding to two different historic events. So the one group of Greeks, it's about 50-50, date the beginning of their history really to the winning of the Trojan War, which took place in about 1100 BCE. The other group of um, Greeks said, yeah, that was kind of pre-Greek, but real Greek culture begins with the first Olympics that were dedicated to Zeus. That began in 776 BCE. So either date is acceptable. And here's how important the Troy story actually is. You can also see this in the movie Gladiator. Or I'm sorry, in the movie, not Gladiator, that's about Rome. In the movie Troy, with Brad Pitt. Okay, yeah. An epic tale of gods and heroes set to Troy over 3,000 years ago. And the Iliad is one of the most important the artworks of all time of warrior, of because of what they're about to talk about. Achilles, son of the seaman Thetis, an immortal oh. name, Peleus. The city, the war begun almost 10 years ago, and Helen and Sparta was stolen away by the Trojan hills and, and we are now not sure whether she was stolen or went willing. Total war, ancient style. We have now found the city of Troy in Turkey and are excavating. So it is a real city. The Greeks and best warrior by claiming to spoil the war of Naval Perseus. Achilles leaves the battlefield, honor affronted. So Achilles' mother, Thetis, asked Zeus to let the Trojans have the upper hand to show the Greeks they need a son. Now there's a truce, although Paris, the lover of a warrior, is almost killed in a general of Helen's husband. Heading into battle, Trojan champion Hector says a revolution goodbye to his wife and child. The fighting resumes, spurred on by the gods and the Trojans are winning. Achilles still refuses to fight, but the Greeks know their foes fear him, so his best friend, Patroclus, tries to claw the Trojans by wearing Achilles' armor. He is killed in battle by Hector. Enraged, Achilles vows to men, the merry army, newly fashioned by Hephaestus, the blacksmith god, who re enters the battle and slays Hector. Still incensed, Achilles defies Hector's rules. 
which the Greek bodies with the Greek world should not do. You're supposed to treat your enemy with respect after you kill them. Now, this is one of the most important epics, one of the most important stories in human history, and generally is considered one of the most important artworks, even though it's in a written format in world history, because it challenges us to go from artwork that was before the Iliad, looks, and we'll, we'll show you a couple of different images, looks very abstract, and after the Iliad looks much more realistic. Because in order to tell those type of stories, you have to be able to identify who's Achilles, who's Patroclus, who's the, um, who is Hector within it. And so that Trojan War we now know is a real war. We've actually found the evidence. It's called the Iliad because the ancient city of Troy was Ilium. It's the foundation of Western culture. And one of the remarkable things is that one out of every four Greek artworks in history is what comes from Homer's stories, either in the Iliad or in the Odyssey. That's one out of every four. That would be like saying one of every four artworks today comes from the Bible. And that's just not the case. It's still a high percentage, but maybe it's two or three percent, not 25 percent. The reason why you need to know about the Iliad and it's so important, this top 10 list comes from a former student that was an honor student that made this list for all of you. It treats the enemy sympathetically. So the Trojans are treated sympathetically. Why? Because war is taking place. People on both sides are dying. The artists were inspired to create realism. And then after realism, that's not good enough for your gods and for your heroes. They move to idealism very quickly. Homer, Homer does not separate the characters into the good and the bad, but shows you the humanity of each. Achilles is a fantastic warrior, but he degrades an enemy soldier, Hector, after killing him, and that bothers many of the Greeks and insults the gods. The Iliad was originally an oral epic meant to be sung or chanted to an audience, which makes it interesting because we didn't write it down for the better part of 300 years. So imagine if we didn't write down the stories of George Washington until basically today. George Washington would probably be like Captain America, being able to dodge and, and everything that he's able to do, because we tend to exaggerate the best features as we tell a story. So stories kind of grow, and that's how long it took before we wrote down the Iliad. Homer's account of the story um, of the Iliad in ancient Greece is considered actual history. So if a god threw a rock and hit someone in the head, which actually happened, that actually really happened. The Western literary tradition begins with Homer's epic poems, not with the Epic of Gilgamesh. Remember, all of those were actually still buried underneath the soil or buried underneath the sand. It's like the heroic virtues that we've come to idealize today, or refrain from excess of cruelty, bravery, honor, calm, and loyalty. Achilles is given a chance in the Iliad, fate versus free will, because he's part God, he's given an opportunity. He has the option of living a long and unmemorable happy life with a loving family, and he'll die in his old age with his family remembering him, but then they'll forget about him over time. Or he can live valiantly and die young in the Trojan War as a hero, which of course is what he chooses to do. So as we think about the Greek, we have all these different references. There's a Netflix series out right now called Helen of Troy. There's another one called Troy. She was considered the most beautiful woman in the world. And we are not sure whether she went willingly or whether she was kidnapped. Her name basically has come to mean as a face that launched a thousand ships. She was so beautiful that her husband, Menelaus, a Greek king, um, organized the Greek nation states and city states to come together to attack. And that launched a thousand Greek ships, giving us one of the most famous battles in all of human history, Hector versus Patroclus. Now, early on in Greek history, the archaic Greek geometric period on your left exemplified by one of your readings, the Diplion Charioteer Vase. This is actually a funerary vase about four feet tall. You can see it has fallen with the earthquakes and been restored. But look at how awkward the different figures are here. Those figures are pretty amazing. That, that apple core looking thing with a dot off the top, that is a supposedly an armor shield with a man's head. You can't tell if that's Patroclus or Hector. We need something much more realistic. So this is right before Homer. Right after Homer, look where we go. We go to uber realism. We can say, all right, so this is the death of Sarpedon, an individual. So we can actually say, all right, here's Sarpedon. Here's the sleep god 
Thetanos. And so we can actually look at this and make out who the figures are. So we can go from abstraction to realism. We probably don't do that without Homer's epic and everyone having to know who the characters are. The other thing that Homer does, because it's seen as real history, he gives us an overview of what the underworld in ancient Greece looks like. That's different than what we see in ancient Egypt. So here's the underworld and the different variations for both the Greek Hades and the Roman world with different names. the god of the underworld. After the victory of the Olympian gods over the Titans, the world was divided by the three brothers. Zeus would reign over the sky, Poseidon would be the lord of the seas, and Hades received the mission to govern the underworld, where he would reign sovereignly alongside Persephone, his wife. Hades' domain was known as the kingdom of the dead because that was the destination of the souls of the perished ones. The underworld was divided into three different territories. Tartarus, which was the place that received the unfair and criminal souls. Their figures like Sisyphus, Tantalus, and Ixion fulfill the eternal punishments ruled by the gods. Tartarus was also where the powerful and imprisoned titans met, locked in a well in the most profound regions of the Tartarus. The fields of Asphodelus, in turn, were the spot reserved for those souls which had not committed major crimes, nor had they reached the glory. This was somehow a somber location where the soul groaned without purpose, falling into the oblivion. The Elysian fields were the place for the souls of the heroes, and for the fair and honored people. The best way to be granted access to the Elysian fields was to perform major feats, which, for the most part, demanded boldness and lots of courage. The souls in this place enjoyed a permanent happiness, but the access to the underworld was not as straightforward. Dying was not the only requirement. The body had to undergo proper funerary rites. A coin was placed between the teeth of the cadaver, or on their eyes. This coin was essential since it was the payment for Charon, the ferryman. After the funerary rites, the god Hermes would take the soul to the shore of the river Acheron, which the ferryman, Charon, waited them to take the soul to the other bank. However, Charon would only take the souls that gave him the coin, which had been buried with the body as a payment. The souls of the unburied ones, or of those who didn't have the coin for the ferryman, were forced to wander for 100 years on the banks of the river until they finally had permission to cross it. Cerberus was on the other side, Hades' dog, protecting the access of his master's kingdom. He didn't prevent any souls to enter, but was implacable with those who tried to get out. Already in Hades' domain, the souls waited for their judgment, which was conducted by the underworld's three judges. These were Minos, the former king of Crete, Radamanthus, his brother, and Aeacus, if Hades approved the judge's decision, not even Zeus could change it. The kingdom of the underworld was cut by several rivers, among them the Acron, the Phlegathon, the Lethe, the Cossidus, and the Styx. The latter was famous for the oaths of the gods, because swearing to Styx was the most sacred vow of the Greek world, and so that would be an unbreakable promise. The kingdom of Hades was a somber place, but what the Greek feared the most was not just the punishments, but the chance of being forever forgotten after their death. So what you can see within this is that the Greek idea of the afterworld and the afterlife is very similar to a combination of Egyptian and of Mesopotamian. There is that area, that very lower Tartarus, that is kind of eternal punishment and damnation. Now that's for bad action. So that follows more on the Egyptian line. Then there's that middle range for people who really didn't do anything that was awful. They just weren't heroes, where there's not really that much punishment, but there's no real joy. It's just the somber mation. That's much more of the idea um, when we look at the idea from Mesopotamian culture and their underworld. And then there's the Elysian fields where the happy heroes go to live out, which becomes the Christian idea of heaven, then that's very much on the Egyptian idea of the afterlife for those people who are ancestral spirits that 
that do really well within the process. And so from based upon what we've looked at, you can, I'm hoping, you can probably tell me now which of these artworks are pre and post homework. Do you look at them? And you're right, the one in the middle is pre homer The one on the right, the Koros, is really kind of during the Homer Homeric era. And then the one we're going to spend the most time on, the post-classical one, is actually very much going to be the post-Homer model. Now if I can move it, yes, to pop up. There we go. Then I can move that. That's the spear bearer. That's one of the most important artworks we will cover. Now, the last thing before we actually start looking at some of the art. So as the art we've seen that's inspired so much modern day art is this a form of government we actually have to discuss here particularly from the athenian perspective and it's that is democracy the best form of government and note we have our united nations sustainable development goals again number 16 dealing with peace justice and strong institutions is democracy the best form of government where everyone gets a vote or most people get a vote here's what some very famous people have said about democracy First off, so Socrates. Democracy would, it seems, be a delightful form of government, anarchic and motley, assigning a kind of equality indiscriminately to equals and unequals alike. Plato, democracy leads to anarchy, which is mob rule. And Aristotle, democracy is when the indigent, another name for the poor, and not the men of property are the rulers. Clearly, none, none of those three thinkers believe that democracy is the first form or the best form of government. That shouldn't surprise us, because if we look at actually our own founders on the right-hand side, look what Thomas Jefferson says about democracy. A democracy is nothing more than mob rule, where 51% of the people may take away the rights of the other 49. Let's face it, we've done that for women only got the right to vote 100 years ago. African Americans were treated like slaves or worse slaves for the better part of 100 years within American history. Benjamin Franklin, democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what to have for lunch. Liberty is a well-armed lamb contesting the vote, i.e. on some level advocating for the idea of gun rule within the process. So is democracy the best form of government? That is up for you. So let's do a vote. We'll do this in class. Let's vote ancient Greek style. We need a ruling class to help run our government. To this end, who should get a free publication to help run the government? The only people that are allowed to vote then would be men who own property. So they out have to outright own their house have to outrun, own their car. They have to own some form of property. That's it, males. And so if you are those, and normally in my class, there's two or three, and I'm one of them, we get to decide, we can't all afford a public free education for everyone. So we're gonna decide on a public education for those people. And who, of course, of the three of us gonna vote for? We're gonna vote for our sons. So we have to be careful with democracy. Now, this brings me to one of my points. You, as a group, millennials, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, if you all voted, you would make up 35% of the electorate. However, you vote at such an abysmal level that politicians don't have to take your rights and what you want seriously. The last election, you voted at 17%. Democracy requires people to vote. It requires, over on the right, an informed population. You've got to know the issues. The hard part for most of us is you have to be willing to vote in the interest of everyone. Are you voting, would you be willing to vote to make your taxes higher if it was going to help someone of a lower class and help the unhappy minority? The vast majority of people are not. We are self-interested animals. We're 99% gorilla and chimp. That shouldn't surprise us. So is democracy the best form of government? I don't believe it is, but is it the best form of government we've currently developed? Probably. Most of the early philosophers in ancient Greece wanted philosopher kings. People that you paid a good salary for, that you educated, and you paid them well enough and they couldn't accept bribes, but paid them well enough that they would make decisions for the rest of us. Almost like the way the Supreme Court works as part of our justice building today. For us then, we need to look at Greek art aesthetics. Remember, in every time period, we look at the art aesthetics. It's how we tell the difference between one culture's artwork and another culture. And for ancient Greek artwork, I cannot emphasize this enough, you're gonna hear this over and over, it's going to be perfection. The Greeks believe in perfection and not good perfection. In the ancient Greek world, there is a gold medal. There is not a silver medal with a winner. Why? That's not perfection, that's a loser. There's not a bronze medal, that's super loser. There's not, oh, good job, fourth place finished, that's uber loser, why'd you bother? 
So the concepts of the Greeks are going to be on perfection. Their artwork is going to deal with politics. In Athens, we're going to deal with philosophy and mythology. All over, we're going to deal with history. And we're going to merge these together in our artworks. When we look at figural forms, early on, we're going to see realism, our choros, sculpture in the male, or chore that you read about um, in the female sculpture. It's going to go from early realism, but we're very quickly going to go to idealism. Because early realism is great to show us every day. But Greek is about perfection, and that's about perfecting things in idealism. We're going to focus on male perfection, specifically on heroism. The people that we're going to be represented are almost always going to be emotionally in control of their bodies. That's what the Greeks considered perfection is calm. We're going to look at optical um, illusions over mathematics because the optics were more important because it's how you solve perfection rather than actual mathematical perfection. There's going to be nudity. That was a matter of perfection. And this idea of a contrapposto pose, this off balance, which you very much see over here in Spear Bear, where if you have one shoulder raised, one other hip is going to raise. And so that the entire body almost has an S curve within it to help support. And so if you look at the differences here, you can see the rigid rigidity of Egyptian art from Menkauri and his wife, Cavernetti, versus the beautiful curves that show, start to show up of the more relaxed posture, more defined musculature that's going to show up in Spear Bear by Polyclitos. And to show you how this develops, note the Koros, this is our archaic Greece. So this is during, basically, during the life of Homer. That very quickly is going to move to Critias Boy, which is our early classic. Note we're starting to get a little movement of the hips, but really the high period that we're going to be looking at that informs our art today, and even Michelangelo's David, is going to be this one here, Spear Bear, the classical pose. A joke for all of us, for that early structure with the chorus right here, here's your chorus line. Those are the women in New York City you don't know, the rockets that kick, called a chorus line. Professor Fraser. Unfortunately, there's Arnold Schwarzenegger making fun of my puny little muscles, saying that he wishes they were as large as my brain. They clearly are not within the process. Um, as an academic, my brain, I'm hoping, will always be bigger. But Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course, has both. And so he and a lot of money along the line. So the whole package within the process. So he's put introducing us to another artwork that changed the world. This artwork called Spear Bear. The word idiot in ancient Greece basically means anyone who's not participating in politics. And so it is, the quote beneath is from Xenophon from ancient Greece. No citizen has any right to be an amateur in the matter of physical training. It is the part of his profession as a citizen to keep himself in good condition, ready to serve his state at a moment's notice. And that is because there's no professional army. There's no professional Navy. There's no professional fire, police, food distribution. When that happens, it is you. The citizens come together as a group, all to help one another. But we're citizens as well as farmers or bankers. So we're not doing this in training all of the time, which poses a problem if we get a professional army like ancient Rome later on that's going to destroy us. So one of the most important artworks in all of human history is the artwork over there, Spear Bear, also called Doryphorus. The artist is actually Polyclitos. Polyclitos' name is so important in the history of art that in ancient Greece and Roman artwork, we actually confused the name and we thought Polyclitos was the Greek name for artist. And so it was very common in the ancient world to say, ah, the best Polyclitos in the world is Polyclitos. Basically saying the best artist in the world is Polyclitos, which it absolutely was during his own day. What makes this artwork so significant, this kind of review of what we'll go over in class, is the following. Note the calm facial expression. In ancient Greece, perfection is about calm. It's about that you are ready to take action. You want your police, your fire, your military always to be calm, not to be enraged, not to be angered. We want them to think through the process. Intellect is very important. So if you look over here then, note the head size is larger than it should be. 
the head size is enlarged to one seventh the body. That's for calm and logic. That was poly, polyclinus' ideal canon. We, the normal size of the head is about one eighth. So by making it one seventh, we basically have packed about 15% more brain power that allows him to control his motion and his intellect. We've made him smarter than everyone else. And that's why he can fulfill the roles of a citizen to vote. He did have a wooden spear. That's why it was called wood spear or spear bearer. A spear has actually been rot and lost over time. He's got the contrapposto codes for realism and balance here. Note, he's got little love handles here, right there and right there. That is the Iliac crest. Basically, it's when you came out of the bath or you came out of the, um, the gymnasium and you were nude, you were ready to go to war because you basically had on your own armor even when you were nude. The model here, even though we do not know his name, we just call him Spear Bearer, we know he's the first Olympic gold medal winner ever in human history. And even he was not good enough just to make a rare, uh, an image of. No, we enlarged his head. We also, if you were to turn this sculpture around, we also removed the 13th vertebrae, and that's the Cossacks, which is the vertebrae that actually allows you to sit. And so we actually removed that to make it even more perfect past the idea deal of realism. His feet raised up on a platform, again, controlling the power. He's nudity for perfection. Small genitalia note is very unimportant. These men had access to sex whenever they wanted. They had prostitutes around. They had wives. They had boyfriends. It's a completely bisexual culture. Um, and so sex is not a competitive market. Men's junk, as well as women's breasts, are not going to get much larger until we actually go through the sexual revolution, which is going to take us all the way until about the 1960s, early 1970s, and the, really the, the advent of porn taking off. He's also going to have six-pack abs as he works out in the gym. His job is to protect family and city-state. As he is the military, the police, the fire, he stands in whenever there is a problem. So he's always got to be ready to act. Women, your job is to nag. If your husband comes down home and he doesn't look like Grievous down the street or Hercules down the street, say, honey, why don't you go back to the gym? Don't you love me enough? Because you don't look like Hercules down the street. And your job ultimately became part of, part of it is nagging. You get the nagging wife. Thanks to the ancient Greeks for that. So this is our modern day male gender role. Calm, cool, athletic, always there, ready to protect, the breadwinner that's allowed outside of the house, six pack abs in everything he does, a citizen soldier, basically. That's what we're looking at. And so for most of Greek history, we're going back and forth about whether the head should be one seventh to emphasize that, or there are a few examples where we just go back to the one eighth which is the actual normal size head. But even today, when we're making military monuments, we mostly make the one seventh model of Polyclitos, rather than on your right, it's Lysippus' um, which is the idea of the one eighth model that shows up here. And did you know an interesting, strange fact from ancient Greece? Move myself up here. The Greeks invented the beauty pageant, where the most perfect teenage Greek males 16, 17, 18, maybe 15, posed nude for older male judges after working out in the all-male gym. That was the birth of the beauty pageant. So the word gymnasium actually means naked exercise place. So hey guys, after class, if I ever ask you this question, you should say no. Hey guys, after class, anyone want to go to work out in the ancient Greek gymnasium naked exercise place with me? You should absolutely answer no, Frazier. So as we talk about reduced inequalities, particularly the rights of those people that are homosexual, bisexual, LGBTQQ, um, question mark community here in our own world, which often have significant challenges in the modern day world. If you were raised in a completely bisexual culture like ancient Greece, where homosexuality was absolutely the norm and moral, there was nothing limiting upon it. What percent of people would participate in that homosexuality culture? The number may surprise you, it's about 85%. Even when considering same-sex prison populations, it ends up being somewhere around 85%. So it's very, very common. A joke on the idea of contrapposto. I'll give you a second to read through it and giggle. This was sent to me by a former student. If you ever find jokes, you're more than welcome to send them. They become part of our PowerPoint presentations. I think my favorite part about this slide is the individual over here 
is very upset, basically calling him a donkey or a jackass, is thinking about burying him just because he learned something new from the ancient Greeks that the women find so attractive. So the Greek perfect male, it's basically a combination of all these things, military, business, ripped musculature, not crying in public. And so the modern perfect man, basically it's established by ancient Greek. We are still working through some of those issues today. And part of that ancient perfect Greek male is you would go to the gym and work out naked with your buds, looking at these sculptures of Olympic heroes, and you would be practicing a number of different events that potentially you could participate in the Olympics, as this is the culture that developed the Olympics. That could be javelin, boxing, pentathlon, the five major events together, high jump, sprint, discus, wrestling, and charioteering in the bottom right. So the ancient Greek Olympics were all events that were dedicated to Zeus. And that is an image of Zeus, um, the best reconstruction image that we currently have. The Olympic Games were started in about 776 BCE, and that is why some Greeks date their history to the founding of the, um, the Olympic Games. Women were not allowed in the Games unless they were unmarried. So it was for men only, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, men only. Women, if you went there and you were married, they would drop you off a cliff on your head and kill you. Because you could go there before you were married, because then you're looking at almost all the events were done in the nude. So you'd be looking at the best, the brightest, so you would know how to nag your husband in the future. Hey, saw this guy 20 years ago. You don't look anything like Hercules. And so you could nag. But once you had a husband, it was your job to nag your husband, not look at ogle at other men that were that beautiful. And so here's the lighting of the, this is the actual remains then at Olympia. So still today, they have the Olympia, and you can go there in Greece to see it. When they go to light the torch, as they will do, in a couple of years for Tokyo, as they go to light the torch, one of the things that shows up is that it's always women that are actually lighting because they're considered closer to the gods, the Vestal Virgins. And so here's the lighting of the torch that then gets run around the planet. It's always done at the Temple of Hera from Olympia, which is right next to the Temple of Zeus. And remember, the Olympics are dedicated to Zeus. All wars would stop. So it was a time of peace amongst the empire. Hot here in Greece today. So early on, the Olympics were a religious celebration dedicated to Zeus. So that's why you see all the formulaic when we try to reproduce. It started the modern day Olympics in 1896, we restarted it. It's gonna be the Roman Christians that end this as a pagan ritual as they convert to Christianity. And now, if you are ever interested, I apply every year to do this and have never been selected, but you can actually run the Olympic torch for one mile. It runs across all sorts of different countries and continents, goes to all the different continents. So it was an amazing experience. And you can have you have to be able to run one solid mile in under ten minutes, and that is how they run the Olympics. The torch. They don't just ship it; it actually gets run around the planet. Just so it starts about a year before the Olympics begin. So you can always apply to try to get this done. This is one of my dreams to be able to do. And so here's the Zeus at Olymp at the Zeus um, at the Temple of Olympia. The sculpture here on the inside that made Zeus that you probably know from the Hercules movie. It actually is done by the, the artist Phidias. He might be considered the greatest artist or the greatest sculptor ever, except that his two most famous sculptures um, don't exist anymore. His medium that he liked to use was ivory and gold, and they're enormous, huge scale. You can see over here. See how small the individuals are. The sculpture, that's all ivory and gold of Zeus. So the white is ivory, the gold statue, the gold staff over here. That white is about 40 feet tall. And so it's elephant ivory. So there is this myth out there that ancient cultures live in harmony with their natural environments. That's just not the case. The truth is ancient cultures exploited their environments to their full capabilities. 
but they did not have the technology or the population to wipe out most animal species or different types of species from plants. Up until clean running water and antibiotics, bacteria kept our numbers in check. And so even though, I mean, think about the number of elephants that would have to make a 40 foot tall sculpture made of ivory front and back, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, potentially even thousands of elephants that would have had to have been slaughtered just to get the elephant ivory within this. That leads us to another United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, number 12, responsible consumption and production. You know, we are using up our world's resources at such a rate that we might not be able to ever recover and get them back. Maybe technology helps us and salvage some of those, but there are areas now in the ocean that are basically floating plastics. So there's these plastic gyres, because when plastic, it basically doesn't break down and go into the environment. It breaks into small little nodules, small little pieces, some of them microscopic. When they blow into the ocean or when they get thrown into the ocean, they swirl around. And so there is a plastic gyre in the middle of the Atlantic and another one in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that are now larger than Arizona. They're larger than major states in the United States of America. And it's just because our population has exploded because with clean water and with antibiotics, our populations go like this, to whoosh, they zoom up. And so during this time period, there's probably only 100 million people on Earth. The Earth could keep up with, with the reproduction, everything else taking place. Today, there's 7.5 billion so almost 75 times more people, and the quality of life has gone way up. You know, they used to live in a house potentially where 40 or 30 people would live in a mansion that is something the size of my house today. It's not even a mansion. It's a four-bedroom house, and we have six people living under that same roof, but they had 45, maybe even 40. The sacred olive tree in Olympia, Greece, which the Olympic gold medals wreath is named. There was not a gold medal. You were given that wreath right here. So that comes from this sacred olive tree right here. And they are zero to hero. If you win the Olympics, then your job was to stay in shape and your body then became the model for all the gods in the future. So here is that zero to hero that you probably all know. So a great montage and it's pretty accurate on what the Greeks thought, except it would be Heracles and not Hercules. There's Hades wanting the hero's body in the underworld rather than potentially reaching Elysium, which he might have just done. From that day and here are the muses, the inspirations for beauty and art that museums are actually known for. Museums are named for these ladies from ancient Greece. So there we have black style figure painting. We're also going to see red style figure painting on pottery. They were heroes and they would have little hero figures. You see, they show up, their accomplishments show up on base painting. We saw that on the Diplion Chirritier base as well. Your heroic exploits show up on various aspects. And you would see actually little figures that people would buy and children would play with their favorite action heroes. That's not a new concept, like the Star Wars figures in the 1970s. Greeks and Romans did that. Greeks did it for their, their heroes and their mythological legend. Romans did it for the gladiators. Remember the Greeks are the ones who invented theater, so now we have theater. You know, the whole idea then here is perfection. Keep calm, controlled, constantly working out, being basically a superhero in front of everyone else, 
both in terms of your body shape and what you can do, but also in terms of the moral compass that shows up. And that's really what the Greeks believed in. That's what perfection was. That's what real role models were, not just because they were good at basketball or they were a great actor, but on the problem or on the side, they had problems, you know, being faithful to their wife or they had problems, you know, with the emotional control was that you had a moral compass um, that was really unflappable and at the same time, a fantastically in shape athletic body willing to help out other people in your society. And that's why these become the model even for gods. So Zeus's model was one of those Olympic heroes. And later on, we are actually gonna use that model for both, if you look on the right, our Lincoln Memorial is based upon the Zeus, as well as so is God in throne. So the Christian God is also based upon this process as well. So our summary, the modern Olympics today that started in 1896, which go to the present. The torch is lit by women at Olympia and travels the world. That is the same as it was in the ancient world. Almost all wars stop as in ancient Greece. It's a time of relative peace over that two and a half week period. Today, we have three medals. The Greeks only had one and it was an olive wreath. Remember, perfection or nothing else. And married women were not welcome. They got the death penalty. This is a male and a culture that is dominated by masculine presence. Women were supposed to stay at home. If they were unmarried, they were allowed to travel just to see what perfection looks like. And then the last image that we'll look at today is this one. This is Discobobulus by Myron. It's the rise of the human action figure. And here we basically take spear bearer and we just put spear bearer in motion. You will notice the head size here is a little bit smaller. It's actually in the middle of one seventh and one eighth, but this is actually an active Olympian in the process. So this would be an Olympic athlete. Um, they still actually have removed that 13th vertebrae, so really he wouldn't be able to move like this at all. And so as we look at the Greek art aesthetics for perfection, politics, philosophy, history, mythology, merge, going from early realism, this is really idealism, this is about where we are. And so when we look at the early history of Greece from the development of philosophy and democracy all the way to the present, it really is on perfection of the male body. And we'll pick up there with kind of the perfection of the female body and what that means for role model and our modern day gender roles moving into kind of architecture the next time that we meet. So have a lovely day. It was great to talk to you. I hope all of you are doing well. Have a great day and I'm going to close up shop now.